and this is a three-part class on Jewish views of the afterlife, traditional and contemporary perspectives. And today we're talking about afterlife and Kabbalistic tradition, post-mortem journey of the soul. And it is June 10th, 2020. And we're uh, doing this under the auspices of Aleph Alliance for Jewish Renewal. And so uh, I want to thank you all for being here. It's going to be a little bit choppy as other people come in. I have to just keep uh, checking in to, to, to um, make sure I let people in. And um, okay, so what I want to do is start with a share of the screen. Okay, so this is this is the course that we're doing, exploring Jewish views, the afterlife, traditional and contemporary perspectives. And um, these are the three parts. Some of you, I think, might be here for the first time. We did afterlife in biblical and rabbinic tradition last time. This, to me, what we're doing today is really the pièce de résistance. This is my distillation of really 20 years of working with, with teachings on life after death. And then next week, I'm going to talk about not the what, what does Judaism have to say about life after death, but rather the so what. So what do we do with that? And um, and you'll see, I, I, I want to, that'll be a little more speculative in terms of how I think it changes the way we think about Shiva Kaddish, Yisker, Yortzeit, funeral, etc. Okay, so uh, last week I got I got some feedback that some people were not muted and somebody was picking up some uh, background noise. If that happens, please unmute yourself and let me know that and I will remind everybody to mute themselves. Um, but what I want to do is let you mute and unmute yourself so we can I can ask your I can answer your questions as we go along. Um, so unmute yourself and let's hear that wonderful cacophony of sounds as as we say the bracha for Torah study. To, and as you do that, hold in your mind and your heart someone for whom you want to dedicate these teachings. It's traditional to offer up um, the the zuchut, the merit of our learning for the sake of somebody's spirit. So just who is it in your heart or mind or who are the, those people as you as you say the bracha together with me? Baruch atah Adonai Holy one of blessing, you give us this chance to soak in these words of Torah. Okay, so I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk a little bit about the nature of the soul in Kabbalah. And then these are the four stages of the afterlife journey. And we'll see how much we get to do on reincarnation. You got a chart, and I'm going I'm to refer to that chart. Um, these are the only, you know, Chibuta Kever is probably the only new Hebrew words you're going to need to learn. That's the earliest phase of the pangs of the grave when the soul sticks around. Gehenna is the realm of purgation and purification and purgation. I wrote purgation and purgation. That's when you're really stuck in Gehenna. Gan Eden, the heavenly garden of Eden, and Shor HaChaim. I don't want to do more on this. This is just my outline for the day. Okay, so here's my first question to you. Just a second, just a second. I got to go back to my Zoom meeting. Oh, okay. You'll forgive me. I'm tr I don't. See okay, here you are. Here y'all are. Um, I can't get this up. Oh no. St oh, I didn't stop my share yet. Stop share. Okay, and then nobody else. Can okay, so I get. I I have the mic. I get to ask the first question. What do Jews believe in life after death? We did a shorter version on this, right? We did this last time. Okay. Anybody, anybody else, anybody who didn't pipe in last time want, want to say something about, about how you were taught about afterlife? Yeah. Joni, you should not be screen sharing. Joni? Okay, I'm trying to get, I'm trying to get out of it. Sorry. <laughs> I'm going to have to kick you out and you're going to have to come back in. Okay, sorry. 
you might not be able to get back in now. All right, anybody? Okay. Yeah, please, Sandra, unmute yourself. I wasn't taught anything about the afterlife except that it all happened here. And what we do here is what we do here. And it wasn't until much later on that I studied some Judaism and Kabbalah that I learned that there was something like an afterlife and there was a, a things that we brought from one life, one soul life to another soul life. But when I was a kid growing up, zero. So many of you would say the same thing. And, and it, it, you know, what Reb Zalman did was really teach us to do archaeology, to excavate the lost Jewish traditions of Kabbalah. And so that's really what I, I have been doing over these, 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 these many years. So this, this here was, was the, the, the story that you often heard. Judaism believes in the life and the living. It dwells on the here rather than the hereafter, as other religions do. Life is precious here and now. Okay, so it turns out that's not the case. And what we need to do is time travel, okay? We're gonna time travel back, particularly today, to the era of the Zohar. Imagine we could time travel and we could interview the people that we would meet and say, what did you believe in life after death? Well, guess what? If you have printed out the handout for what we're going to do today, that's the transcript of the interview. What, I, what I've presented to you is a series of, I don't know, about 10, 15 different quotes that really is, right, Bob, you're holding it up. You can hold it up, right? That's, that is the, that's the transcript of the interview about life after death. So what I found is the stuff that really encapsulate the, the deepest wisdom that has an application for us today comes from the Zohar. Anybody, anybody want to say what the Zohar is? It's up on the screen. Right. The Zohar is basically a midrash on the Torah written in the 12th century in Guadalajara, Spain. And what I want to do is take some Zohar that we're going to study and combine it with some, some Hasidism because the worldview of Hasidism took the teachings of Kabbalah and brought it to the masses. The, the Kabbalah emerges, at least with that specific term, around the 1100s, 12th, 12th century. And it was basically a metaphysical movement that was concerned with the creation of the cosmos, the creation of the human being, and the creation of souls, and then there's stuff about what happens to souls after death. Hasidism takes the teachings of Kabbalah and it brings it to the masses. And so, please mute unless you are speaking. Thank you. Somebody, somebody asked you, Ella, to do that. If you're not, if you're not muted, please make sure you are. It's going to be easier than 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 muting everyone. Um, if I have a fan going in my room, is that is that part of the noise somebody's hearing? Okay. So let's keep going. So Hasidism takes the teachings of Kabbalah and brings it to the masses. Okay. So what I tell you what I want to do. Do I want to do this? I, well, I'm here, so I'm going to do this. I want to tell you a Hasidic story. Okay. And this story will embody the central teachings of Kabbalah. Now, I usually like to stand up when I do my storytelling. Hi, you've probably heard me do the story somewhere along the way. I don't know if I can do, yes, I'm gonna do it here. Okay, so here's the story. It's a story told of Rebbe Elimelech of Lezhensk. Elimelech of Lezhensk was one of the first and early Kabbalistic masters, and he had a friend who, in his lifetime was a great Torah scholar. And his friend came to him one day and said, my time to leave the world is rapidly approaching. Can you do me a favor? So Eli Malik says, sure, I'll do you a favor. What can I do for you? He says, can you educate my son in the ways of the Jewish people? So Eli Malik says, sure, I will, but on one condition. 
What do you mean on one condition? What kind of condition do you make with, the, with a guy who's dying? He says, I will educate your son on the condition you come back and tell me what it's like on the other side. So they shake, it's a gentleman's agreement, and Eli Melech does everything, does everything to take care of the son. You know, he sends him to all the great yeshivas, comes time for a bar mitzvah, they had two bands at the bar mitzvah, you know, it was like really, it was very classy, it was a very classy kind of thing, all the way up to the time of, of the marriage. In this culture, you, 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 you know, you, you, you educate somebody, you, it's a shidduch, it's arranged marriage, you know, the, the, whatever, she had been to the mass, she had a master's degree, she had been to the orthodontist, you know, he, he really does it well. There's a variant text that said he could choose whatever gender he wanted to marry. All of that's in the text, you have, you have to go look it up. So comes the afternoon of the wedding, the groom's family is there and the bride's family is there, and Eli Melech, who was the stand-in for the groom's late father and the officiating rabbi was nowhere to be seen. You know, this, this was a problem. The hors d'oeuvres were getting cold. The guests were getting fetchy. What were they going to do about it? They wait an hour. They wait two hours. After two hours, they send one of his Talmud and one of his students to go look in, 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 in the, Rebbe's, you know, the Rebbe's study. They look in the keyhole, and the Rebbe is meditating. You can't disturb the Rebbe if he's meditating. I mean, that would be terrible. They wait another hour, and finally he comes. He does, he does the wedding. You know, at the end of the wedding, they break the glass, and they cry, Mazel Tov, Mazel Tov. And then after, he gets up to address the guests. The reception, he says, I suppose you're wondering where I was. Let me tell you a story. So he tells the guests the story of, the, of his late arrangement, of his arrangement with the groom's late father. And he said, here, I had fulfilled my part of the bargain and he hadn't yet fulfilled his, so I was going to sit and wait. And I'm sitting and I'm waiting and I'm waiting and finally I hear, Ali Melech, Ali Melech. I go, Chaim, Chaim, is that you? What was it like? He said the following. He said, the moment of death was absolutely painless. It was like taking hair out of milk. And I could see all the people crying and shrying. And I said, stop, I'm over here. But they couldn't hear me and they couldn't see me. I figured, you know what? They'll figure it out. They made a mistake. And again, I could see the Hebra Kadisha, the burial society, preparing my body for, for burial. And I say, you're wasting your time. I'm over here. Again, they couldn't hear me. They couldn't see me. I figured, you know what? They'll bury me. I'll come back home and it'll all be okay. I follow the procession out to the cemetery and everybody leaves and I have this burning desire I have to get back home. And I'm starting to dig out very furiously, digging out of the ground and, and it's starting to thunder and it's starting to lightning and I realize I have to build a raft to get across the raging river and I'm getting very panicky and I go, do I go? Do I stay? Maybe I should stay. Do I go? Do I go? I don't know what I don't cry. Help! And all of a sudden, I see before my eyes this great, 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 great being of light. And this being of light says, don't you know, you're no longer in the world of confusion. You've entered the universe of truth. And instantly I could see a panoramic vision of every single deed I've ever done in my life. And I'm to stand for judgment. And I wait and I wait and the judgment comes down after all that. Basically, I've been a God-fearing man. Basically, I tried to serve my creator. So I don't enter into Gehenna, purgatory. The footnote is there's no eternal damnation, but I enter into Gehenna. I don't enter into Gehenna, but there are ways in which I could have more fully fulfilled my destiny. I could have more fully served my creator. I could have, I certainly could have paid my synagogue dues on time. So I don't enter into the heavenly garden of Eden. So what's gonna happen to me, I ask. So I'm assigned a resting place in between Gehenna and Gan Eden, where on one hand, I see the lofty heights of the heavenly garden of Eden. And on the other hand, I see the torments of Gehenna and my soul is cleansed of any further defilements and my soul aspires to the highest light, light, the, the highest sites of, of, of Gan Eden. And there I stay. Now it says in our tradition that on Shabbat, all souls are released from Gehenna. The first Shabbat came, I entered into Gan Eden and it was fantastic. It was sublime, it was blissful. The messenger of the heavenly tribunal said, come to me and says, come on, you have to go to your resting place in between Gehenna and Gan Eden. I said, forget it. I like it here. I'm not going. He said, no, no, you have to go. I said, you know what? I studied Torah with Rebbe Ali Melech of Lezhensk, and that should be on my merit record. So you go to the heavenly tribunal and you tell him, 
I'm staying here. So the messenger goes and comes back from the heaven tribunal and says, it's been determined on high that you will in fact shall right, you shall rightfully take your place in Gan Eden eventually. But it was known that in your lifetime you made a promise to Rebbe Elimelech of the Jets, and until you fulfill that promise to Rebbe Elimelech, you can't rightfully take your place in Gan Eden. So Rebbe Elimelech is at the wedding and he's telling everybody this story. And he says, so I said to him, come on, let's go. You know, your, your son's getting married. Yeah, well, you got to go make a lechaim. He says, where I'm going is so sublime, so blissful, that I can't wait a second any longer. So you go to the wedding and you make a lechaim on my behalf and you tell everybody there to make a lechaim on my behalf and to tell the story to everyone they know and then to tell everyone they know the story and to make a lechaim on my behalf and to tell everyone they know to tell everyone they know the story to make a lechaim on my behalf. So lechaim, lechaim, lechaim and I share with you that story exactly as I first heard it. Okay, so we're going to swim in that story for a little while, and then we're going to look at some text, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about the soul. Anybody, if you want to unmute yourself and you want to comment on anything stand out for you in that story? You're, you're, you're overwhelmed by it? I, I can keep going, but I'm just... I, I, I like the uh, story within the story aspect of it, which is uh, closer to the way reality works. Right? <laughs> But I'm telling you, that's exactly how it was told to me. Exactly, exactly, exactly. I was well, a little okay. bit confused about who raised the kid and was Ellie Malik the Rebbe, and I was a little bit confused about the who was who, but not the traveling to Aiden and back. And it reminds me of a joke I can't tell on Zoom. Okay, don't. No, well, Ellie, Ellie Malik was the stand in for the groom's late father. But I think the, the essence of the story, okay, what it is is, is it, if, if we did this. Within an academic context, I could show you footnotes in the story that refer to stuff in 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 Talmud and stuff in 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 in, in Kabbalah. Is that image at the at the grave site where he's going? Do I go? Do I stay? Do I go? Do I stay? Do I go? Do I, go, do I stay? Speaks of something called Chibut Takever. So I'm going to move it back to the screen a second, and 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 I, I, I'm 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 going to pull together a couple of pieces on this. I, I need to put it into context in the following way. Wait, I got, I got to do my screen sharing first. So, hang on. Okay. Takes three clicks, so you'll forgive me, but I'm with you. You got this, right? We're, at, we're okay. So, here's what, here's how I want to, I want to put it into context. The way we think about what it means to be alive and to be human being determines the way we think about afterlife and death. You know, when, 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 we, when we encounter the reality of dying and death, invariably it raises the question of who am I? What is it? You know, you see somebody, you're living a life and then somebody goes like that. Invariably it makes us realize our own mortality. And what does it mean to be a human? What does it mean to die? And what happens after I die? Some people don't ask this question. For some people, the unexamined life is well worth living. I, you, you, I know a few people like that, and you probably know a few people like that. But invariably, the reason why you're in this class, the reason why you're studying these, the, you know, Kabbalah and, and, and Jewish renewal is that this, these questions stir something in our soul. So if you ask that question from the standpoint of Western materialistic psychology, when you, what does it mean to be a human being and what, what happens when you die? Anyone? Unmute yourself. What happens when you die? It's right on the screen. I'm giving away the question. I'm asking the question, I'm giving away the answer, right? I like to hear some voices. You're dead. Dead is dead. Dead is dead. There's a whole lot of people who believe that, okay? <laughs> You know, uh, there's always a guy in, in, in when I teach in a conservative congregation, there's a guy sitting there like this with a big fat ring, you know, I, and he's saying, I don't believe in any of that afterlife garbage. Now let's start talking. To him, I say, I'm not selling my belief, but I'll sell you my book. But, you know, so for some people, the notion of, of any consciousness after death is, 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 is a fantasy. Um, you know, Freud says standing beside the, the, a dead body, 
uh, the dead, the dead body of a human loved one, the human beings invented spirits and afterlife. And um, uh, this is not exact quote from, from Stephen Hawking, but, but in, in neuroscience, consciousness is an epiphenomenon of the brain produced by firing of neural synapses. When the, when the brain stops firing, you're dead. Of course, near-death experiences changes that, but that's one model. The other model is the, the traditional is a Catholic theology that, that, you know, when you die, you have a choice. You can either go down and, you know, and what, what does it look like if you go down? It looks like fire, burning. What, what does it look like if you go up? Angels, right? Clouds. I think I don't have that. So clouds, they let you smoke. It's because they let you smoke at the bar. That's that. I didn't have that slide here. Okay. So that's, yeah, please. And here, I'm, I'm unmuting you. Go. Unmute yourself. Okay. It, it's interesting because Catholics have um, purgatory, which reminds me of this middle thing, not quite. But I wanted to say that um, when you said about psychologists and this and that, um, I had the experience of my family and psychiatrists saying, what's wrong with her for asking such questions? Something's wrong with her. And it was only years later at university, I, was, I took a philosophy elective and they asked these questions and I felt like I'd finally come home. I never knew there was a discipline that asked these questions that I had always asked and been made fun of for asking. Is, so I is, went into philosophy. <laughs> well, you know, in a way, we're 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 in we're in, we're in, we're in a, a bridge period, you know, like we're going from sort of death as a grim reaper that has no no sense of 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 compassion and is very dark to a being of light. You know, we're sort of moving our 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 yeah. our, our baseline is, is shifting. We, you know, when I started doing this work, nobody was talking about afterlife in Judaism. Now there's a you know there's a lot more stuff yeah. out. But still, yeah. a lot of Jews still don't think about this. Yeah. Okay, so when we go to Kabbalah, what it means to be alive, here's my sexy word. A human being is a biopsychocosmic continuum. Tell them they taught you that in your, in your, in your afterlife <laughs> class. We, you know, and you don't, you don't have to take my word for it. You know, hey, how are you doing in the body? You know, like, how are you today? It's a little bit cloudy here. I could feel the low pressure. You know, what are you, you know, I've been drinking too much coffee. How are you? You know, you, you, we don't, we're not getting enough exercise these days. You know, I'm, my social distancing problem is keeping six feet away from the fridge. You know, like how, how right? So a bio, <laughs> psycho is our emotional being our sort of like psycho-mental being, our emotional mental being. And then beyond that, we connect with the universe. Like this is, if you, it, 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 let me go back here. This is the Kabbalistic way of looking at yud heh vav -Hey, the name of God. So if you look, it looks like a little person. So there's the physical realm. There's the emotional realm. It looks like, you know, the Vav is the heart, midsection. The arms hold the head and then their spirit. And while we're alive, we're an amalgam of body, emotion, mind, and spirit. You know, so you have your own genetic structure, your emotional style, your, your, your cognitive thinking, but also the higher mind. Like when you look at a picture from the, of the Hubble telescope, like this is a picture from the Hubble telescope and you go, wow. You know, so, and then there's another place where, we, where we're interwoven to the fabric of the universe. That's what we call God in a Kabbalistic sense. So these are the levels. I don't want to do too much on this, but, but, but each of those, in Kabbalah, each of those levels of body, emotion, mind, and spirit are part of what we're alive, part of who we all were, were alive. I call it body, emotion, mind, spirit, and cosmos. If you're stickle Kabbalist, it's nefesh, ruach, neshama, chaya, yefida. Okay, in death, this is where I'm going with this. In death, each of these realms go through periods of transformation. You see, the, the traditional, certain Christian model, you know, like I say hell, you get images of what hell looks like. You know where, you know where that comes from? It, it comes from Christian Renaissance art. 
I say mm -hmm. pictures of heaven, you get pictures of heaven. It's Christian Renaissance art. Christian Renaissance art, more than medieval midrash, is what's, what's implanted. It's, it's what's implanted in our, our mind. And when we say heaven and hell in traditional Christian thinking, you think location. The fundamentalists want you to think about a location, okay? So when I would go visit my son in Bloomington and I would drive to the, um, to the airport in Indianapolis, there was a sign that said, avoid hell, repent. And I always stopped and checked my GPS just to make sure I didn't want to take a wrong <laughs> turn, okay? In the Kabbalistic <laughs> model, afterlife is not a location, it's a journey. This is, this is very important. This is Reb Zalman's wisdom on this. While we're alive, we're on a journey. You know, <laughs> hey, how's your life doing? You never imagined your life would look like this, eh? We never imagined this one. Who knows what next week's going to bring? You know, two weeks ago, we didn't realize we'd be through the, the, these next two weeks here in this, in, in, in this country or in the world. We don't know what's coming next. We don't know, right? So, but we're, we're, in a, a, we're in a nexus of all kinds of relationships and interactions. In death, each of those parts of our body, by, uh, uh, emotion, mind, spirit, go through a process of transformation. I'm just preparing you for where we're going to go. You with me? I'm going to go. The, anyone, some comments, questions? Yeah. Katya? No, you're just, you're just giving me a thumbs up. Okay. I, I'm with you. Yeah, good. Good, 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 good. Well, I, 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 I'm, I'm ready to go the next step with you. Okay. So here's what I want to. Okay. This is my, this is my triptych. If afterlife is a journey, I just went to AAA. I should put a little AAA logo on here. I got a triptych, okay? My, my charts go from the bottom on up. Some of you have studied a little bit of Jewish renewal stuff, so you're familiar with the you know, sort of four worlds Kabbalah that, 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 that Reb Zalman got out of, uh, uh, out of, um, uh, out of Tanya, out, of, out of, of Hasidut, and also Arika. He learned that from, from Marika. So it's a fourfold journey. Here's, here are the stages and then we're going to now go through. Physical separation. In death, there is a process of separating from the physical body. The consciousness leaves the body and there's a process. Then there's a process of emotional purgation. Emotional purgation is cleaning up the schmutz under the rug. I'm going to talk about this. I'm going to keep coming back to this chart. If you have it, keep it out in front of you. Intellectual contemplation is in the Maimonidean sense of sort of seeing God. And then spiritual unification is uniting with God, being with God. Okay, so I'm, this, is, this is the outline of where we're going. You ready? Bob, can I ask you to be my reader today? Do you, you have your text in front okay. of you? Uh, yes. Okay. Here we go. The, when, okay. I'm, now I'm teaching you Chibuta Kever, the pangs of the grave. Remember when Rebelli Melech's friends go, do I go, do I stay, do I go, do I stay, do I go, do I stay? It's said to be a three to seven day period when the soul is potentially confused as to whether it's alive or dead. Bob, please read. Chibuta Kever, pangs of the grave. Rabbi Yehuda said, for seven days, the soul goes to and fro from his house to his grave, from his grave to his house, mourning for the body. Okay. If I didn't teach you anything else the rest of the day, I think that's a very useful factoid. For seven mm -hmm. days, the Kabbalah, and listen, Kabbalah is based on rabbinic stuff. So this isn't just Kabbalah, right? For seven days, the soul goes to and fro, from his house to his grave, from his grave to his house, mourning for the body. What does that suggest? If, if you can speak, uh, unmute yourself. Confusion. Confusion? Well, potentially, you know, some people leave, some people go through life much more aware and awake and some people uh, less so. Yeah, go on, Lori. Suggests um, another creation. Seven days of creation is like well. It, it has it has a it has a mythic resonance with that, right? What is it? What does it tell us about death and life after death? That there's an intertwining going on here between what we consider to be life and death. 
Yes. And Chibuta Kever seems to be, I'm doing this, it's like an intermezzo phase between death and whatever comes next. I saw Marla, you were going to say something? I just said, and it, it sort of presupposes that the soul continues, like it goes on. There isn't really a death. There's just a death of the body. Well, look, the, obviously, if I'm teaching class on Jewish views of the afterlife, I have a bit of a bias. You know, ultimately, I think we all have to do our meaning, our own meaning making around belief and how we deal with it. But what, what it is, is that people I meet, I, I don't have access to the database of information about it. And so we need to check it out with Shirley MacLaine and the, and the Tibetan master. <laughs> but to understand that, that we have an inherent Jewish approach to dying and death that has a spiritual perspective is really, that's what I've been teaching for years. And next week, I'm going to talk about it in terms of how that affects the way we think about Shiv and Kaddish. Bob, you, you were going to say something? I was, maybe you'll get to this uh, next, but it implies to me that the Shiva process, what happens in that first week, uh, has a role to play in the process of the soul's journey, as well as, because I was always taught the Shiva is for the living. It's to give them comfort, it's to give them support, it's to help everything else, you know, but it also creates a setting for a grounding for this type the of thing. Shiva, we go, who catered that Shiva? That was like a really, really good Shiva. Right. <laughs> right? Yeah, well, hang on. Let's let's go back here. What do we do at the? What do we do at the? Here, this is this is Maira Alinsky. Uh, she took that quote for seven days. The soul goes back and forth from its home to its grave, from its home to its grave, mourning for the body. Um, I could stop the share. I'm trying to be both present and share some of these texts. So what do we do at the end of the Shiva? We go on a diet. Okay, yeah, 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 I understand that. What else do we do at the end of the Shiva? Go for a walk around the block. Why do we go for a walk around the block? To bring closure. Also to re-entry into community. Right, we sort of say we've taken this time out of time and now we're going to re-enter into our lives. And we're at some other level, we're saying to the neshama, saying to the soul, we're going to walk you this far, and now you have to go the rest of the way on it on, on your own. When when my wife got up from Shiva for her father, it was the Parsha of Jacob's death, where it says Jacob is gathered to her an his ancestors. So she said, before we're going to walk her on the block, it would be helpful for me to hear who are the ancestors to whom my father has been gathered. So we all went around the room and we mentioned, we mentioned, you know, friends of ours who had died and my, my father-in-law's first cousin was there. So we mentioned his, their mutual grandmother, you know, first cousins have the same grandmother. And then we got up and walked around the block, but it was very much of a sense of like, now we're escorting the soul on the journey. And we don't usually see Shiva that way. You know, it's, it's the third night of Shiva just a second, Sandra, Sandra, I'll come to me. It's the third night of Shiva. You couldn't have another cold cut if they gave it to you intravenously. You just couldn't, right? <laughs> yeah. And, 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 and once, you know, it's 11 o'clock, Uncle Lou just left, so there's no more sexist humor for a while. And one <laughs> sister says to the other, didn't it feel like daddy is in the room? And people have those experiences, but they don't have a Jewish framework for it. Sandra, <laughs> your comment? Well, I, I was going to say, what about the Shloshim, the 30 days of elevating the soul? I'm not, I'm not sure I'm going to have that text in here, but there's a text that says that eventually the soul, it, it's, you know, the, the language they use is of removing garments. So angels come and remove our terrestrial garments and put on our celestial garments. So I can sort of give up this, 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 this karmic incarnation and go to a more transcendent one. And they say that that never happens before 30 days. So, so they understand that there's a transitional period after death. And look, I don't know where they got this stuff. 
but at least to know that, you know, we're not the only culture that speaks about a three to seven day period. The Tibetans do that, the Native Americans do that, the Hindus do that. You know, it's, it's hardwired into a lot of different places. Kaya, were you gonna? Yes, yeah, so when my mother was dying in that subliminal space, she was talking to her mother. Good, so that's the next quote that's coming so, up. So then that, so it also tells me that there's, that the person who is in the process of dying is also seeing their ancestors. I, I, the, I'm gonna the, have to pay you for, 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 for being the great segue. Marla, your question and then we're gonna go to the next uh, part. Yeah, I have a question about the walking around the block. Is it significant that we go around the block? Like, is there significance about walking around or is it just taking a walk that's the well, ritual? It's, the, you know, you know, I don't think when they did it in the time of the Shulchan Aruch, they had city blocks. But I think the sense of a completing a circle is is part of it. Um, and, and again, this is not halakhically stipulated. It's, it's more of a minhag. It's more of a custom. Um, you know, we, you, maybe if you live in a big apartment building in Manhattan, maybe you just go from the 50th floor down to the, down to the first floor and back. I don't know. <laughs> you know? Okay, so, so that there has to be some kind of rich, uh, Kabbalistic because even in a wedding, the the bride and groom circle each other. Well, the number seven is archetypal. The number the seven number seven is archetypal. But the, but the, also okay. the circling. Good. So let's get, let let next comes up a series of texts that I call deathbed visions. Okay, and this stuff corresponds 100% with the near-death experience literature. Today, there's near-death experience. Today, there's more resuscitation technology available than any other point in human history, okay? The, 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 they actually have developed um, cold room, ice rooms in, in major city hospitals where if somebody codes, they put them on ice, and there's a guy by the name of um, Parna is his last name. I don't remember his first name. Where he says he's been, he's been able to keep people alive for an hour keep people, bring people back after an hour without any brain damage. So we're still in the very early stages of investigating this phenomena. But seeing that you mentioned this, Chaya, I want you to be, you, you read this next one, okay? This is 12th century Guadalajara. It's not like that, not, not a near-death experience from 1992. Rabbi Shimon said, have you seen today the image of your father or your mother, for so we have learned that at the hour of a person's departure from the world, their father or mother and other relatives gather around and they see, eat, see them and recognize them and likewise all with the, whom they had associated in this world and they accompany their soul to the place where it is to abide. I'm in the midst of, so of, of el eliminating my gender specificity of all of these, uh, of, of, of all these. Okay, so let's just talk about that one. It, at, at the hour of a person's departure from the world, their mother, their father show up. Anybody want to comment on that? They didn't teach you that in Hebrew school either, right? And it, in a way, you know, like I, I said to my mother at the end of her life, I said, you know, I imagine your father's going to be there for you because her father died when she was 10 years old and she just lit up. You know, she wouldn't have seen her father for, you know, like 75 years. You know, she was 88 at the end of her life. So, yeah, Ali Sheva. I have, I have two parallel thoughts on that. One is that I wonder if, you know, before a baby is born and it's been gestating inside a belly and heard the voices of people welcoming it, I wonder... Um, one, what a pre-born baby experiences before they incarnate. And I had this image when my dad was dying, for sure, for sure. He saw the people, they were on the train and all this. Um, and, and it occurred to me that I felt like he was being reborn. I felt like, oh my gosh, they are going to be there celebrating and applauding and welcoming like that newborn little baby soul, just the way we, he was welcomed here at one part of his incarnation. Like maybe he's being birthed over there and they're there to like, it, it gave me great, great, great comfort to imagine that celebration. And, you know, now we're called to sort of allude to what we're talking about next week. 
we're now we're, we're training people as death doulas, you know, birth doulas are sort of midwife assistants. And now, you know, if death is a kind of transition and not an end, we want to be able to help people move out, you know, gently. And, you know, so, so let me go back to um, the, the text, because it, it's interesting um, in, in, uh, in both in, hang on, I have to, let me just move this. All right, I have to do it. Give me a second. Sometimes it's friendlier than other times. Okay, in the near-death experience literature, there are two kinds of visionary phenomena. There's what I call the mommy, daddy, bubby, zadie level, sort of familial beings, and then there are ancestral beings. So, uh, Bob, you're my you're my uh, okay. Peter? No person dies before seeing the Shekhinah. Uh, and because of its deep yearning for the Shekhinah, the soul departs in order to see her. And with the Shekhinah, there comes three ministering angels to receive the soul of the righteous. Uh, when one departs this world, they see many strange things on their way and meet Adam, the first human sitting at the gates of Gan Eden, ready to welcome all who have observed the commands of their master. Okay. So in the near-death experience literature, this is, this is similar where the Hindus see Krishna and the Christians see Jesus or Mary and the Buddhists see the Buddha. And we don't have a natural iconography. Like we don't have, an, an image of Adam doesn't come to mind because of the prohibition on images. But I can tell you on good, on, 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 on you know, on good, good uh, background that, that, Jews see somebody from the Federation. <laughs> so, uh, you know, uh, can I say something about? Go. Uh, I, uh, um, again, uh, from other sources besides Jewish ones, of, of people who study this and work with people and past life regression and all that type of literature. Um, I guess the concept has come up that the seeing the Bubby and Zadie and uh, other people in the family is a transitional imagery that is acceptable to this to the soul that's just beginning to detach from the physical plane and then once they uh, the soul does detach and progress in its journey um there is no need for those images anymore uh, that's one another way of looking well you know there, there was a guy by the name of roger wolger who did stuff on 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 past life you know so he was a jungian analyst he was in vermont for many years and he did stuff on past lives and he and I presented at a conference and and I presented this model based upon my studying of texts and he presented his model based upon upon thousands of hours of working with people and his his reflection was that some people were were vibrating at a vibratory level where a familial being could help them out of the body and other people were vibrating at a different level where some kind of mythic being so I don't know, you know, I had this uncle who was, um, who was, you know, from the, from the vintage of, he ran away from the czar's army and, you know, after World War I, and he came to America, he actually came to Canada. And, um, and his motto was, hero Israel, the dollar and God, the dollar is one. I mean, you know, he was a, like many of his generation, he worked for, you know, 20 hours a day, he amassed his fortune. And he was rapidly anti-religious. I mean, one time I wanted to light a Habdala, I lit a Habdala candle in his house and he nearly threw me out. But another time he said to me, I nearly died and Rabban Gomliel came and said, Yoni, it's not your time. His name was Yona. Yona we call him uh, John, Uncle Yonas, we used to call him. And who shows up for him in his near-death experience? I nearly died. Rabbi Gamliel, Rabban Gamliel from his Talmudic youth in yeshiva. And this was not a guy who had read the near-death experience literature. You know, this was not an educated man. But who shows up for him is Rabban Gamliel that he would have learned about because he was in a Sadagora community in, 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 you know, he was with the Sadagora Rebbe in, 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 in Europe. So it really raised the question for me, like, are there images of helper guides that we paint in the cultural nuances that we're familiar with. Right. So you know who the kids are seeing in today's near-death experience literature? Yoda. <laughs> right? Makes sense. Yoda's Yoda. an interdimensional being. Yeah. Okay. One last. Okay, Bob, you're still my reader. Oh. 
Go go on. Question? Has Dumbledore shown up in any of your uh, have, uh, have I stumbled upon what? Dumbledore. You said Yoda, but I imagine. Well, I, I, you know, there are people who have studied who have who have studied children's near death experiences. So I read that somewhere. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, uh, I'm, I'm not sure. But Yoda makes more sense to me. Okay. Um, let's go. Okay, so let let let's let's go back. Okay, so so those those two, and I think, well, uh, th this is what I want to talk about next week. But I think talking to people about that in people who are near the end of their life to say, you know, who do you imagine being there for you? I think that's I think that's a very important kind of question. If I may say so, this is one of my favorite graphic images. It's amazing what uh, okay. you can find when you ask Reb Google to find you an image. Okay, so <laughs> so, so when, this is okay. So hang on, we're there. Oh no, I didn't. I, we didn't read that one. Go. Oh. When when God desires to take back a person's spirit, all the days they have lived in this world pass in review before them. Okay, so this. This is, this is the life review, and we have it in our language. I saw my life flash before my eyes. In the story, he has a panoramic vision of all of his deeds. In the near-death experience, people have what they call the life review. And I worked in hospice, and I think when people are dying there, it, it's almost as if the black box recorder goes on auto replay before they die. That's certainly been my experience. Sometimes people relive the, 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 the earlier years of their life. And I, and, and, and I think the implications of this is that we want to help people tell the story of their lives. Comments, questions, because the journey is going to continue. I have to make sure I get you in and out of Gehenna on time. Yeah, what, we have another 40 minutes. Okay, so I, pr I promise you I'll do that. Okay, so here's the chart again, okay? So this, we have been talking about the phenomena, the visual, the visionary phenomena related to physical separation of the body. And Hevra Kedisha, funeral, and Shiva are the rituals in this early phase. And then we want to begin to think about those as soul-guiding rituals. And that's all I'm going to say more about that next week. Then another phase of the journey another set of, of experiences of, of the transformation of consciousness begins, we call Gehenna. So, okay, let, no, no, let me say something about Gehenna before I, we, we, we do the text. Did I, did I stop my share? Okay, so Gehenna is based upon a rabbinic term Gay Ben Hinnom, the Valley of the Sons of Hinnom. Hinnom. It, was, it was a place in Jerusalem where the Moabites did child sacrifice. And if you've ever raised a teenager, you know why some species eat their young, but that's, that's, that's just a footnote on this one. So the rabbis, last week I talked about Sheol, and the rabbis, by the time it came to rabbinic period, Gehenna emerged on the scene. So as you're going to see, the Kabbalists take the notion of Gehenna and they psychologize it a little bit. But I, 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 want, to, um, I, want, to, I want to try to explicate it in, in a way that makes psychological sense. That's sort of what I've been trying to do with this stuff generally is how does it speak to our, 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 our contemporary mind. If somebody came up to you and kicked you in the shins and spacked you across the face, say it was your friend Joe, and I came up to you six, you know, and you'd be like totally furious with this person. And I came up to you six months later, I said, whatever, and your friend Joe. And you say, Joe, did I ever tell you what happened with Joe? I'm still so angry. What's my point? Emotions persist long after the initial point of contact, okay? So you can have a fight with your significant other. And then when in the days when we used to go out of the house, you know, you leave the house, you get up the next morning, you, you know, your alarm goes off, you grab your coffee. And then later in the day, you get a, a, a neck ache because they're a pain in the neck or your back hurts because you feel unsupported or you get nauseous because you can't stomach it anymore. Or Louise Hay who does mind body healing that says, or you get a bladder infection because you're pissed off, right? What's the point? 
we know from psychosomatic medicine that we hold emotions in our body. I mean, I'm not telling you anything you don't know. So if you did an x-ray, you would see my bone structure. If you did an MRI, you'd see the tissue structure. Imagine we could do an emotiogram of, of something. So here in the jaw is where we hold our anger. I'm not angry, I said. And here we hold grief. And down the lower section, we hold, we hold shame. We hold emotions in our body. It may be, and this is sort of my speculation on what Gehenna is, is that in death, all of the unresolved psycho-emotional stuff of life that we've swept under the rug, we have to sift through before we can go on. You know, while you live long enough, you know that there's a certain amount of unresolved stuff, whether it's the shame of not living up to your higher values, whether it whether, whether it's it's grief and loss, whatever we carry some of those. So now I need somebody to read this next text with a little bit of um, a little bit of Shakespearean schmaltz. How about it, Bob? Okay, so this right. one, this one is not Zohar. It's called it's from a text called Ketzad Din Hakever. It's sort of medieval midrash. This is the Jewish Dante material. Go. Gehenna. There are five kinds of punishments in Gehenna, and Isaiah saw them all. He entered the second compartment, and he saw two men hanging by their tongues, and he said. O oh, you who unveils the hidden, reveal to me the secret of this. He answered, These are the men who slandered, therefore they are thus punished. He entered the third compartment, and he saw there men hanging by their organs. He said, O oh, you who unveils the hidden, reveal to me the secret of this. And he answered, These are the men who neglected their own wives and committed adultery with the daughters of Israel. Okay, so this is very important. I want to say this. If your Uncle Saul is in hospice, don't go read him this text, <laughs> okay? It has much more effectiveness as a teaching tool. So here's what I want to say. This, this is what I learned again from Reb Zalman. Teachings on heaven and hell in religious literature are symbolic. They're not literal. Some of you might go out and teach this stuff. So this is an important one. Teachings on heaven and hell in religious literature are not literal in spite of what the fundamentalists want you to believe. They're symbolic of states of consciousness. So what would it be to have a post-mortem moment, what they call the 12-step program, the fearless moral inventory, where you look at your life unadorned and undefensive, and you have a vision, you see all of the times that you shot from the lip and you were verbally abusive to people you loved. It might feel like hanging from the tongue. What would it be to have this post-mortem honest self-encounter and see all of the times that you might have acted with impropriety in your intimate relationships and hurt the ones you love? So what you have here is not so much medieval torture, though I, I, I know exactly what, actually some of these texts replicate medieval torture. And I know what medieval torture looks like because I raised two kids in the same household. So I, I, you know, I saw the older one and doing the younger one, right? But what you have here, when, when I teach says the, the older images of the penal colony, the newer images are, are rehab. You know, you go into rehab and you have to deal with all the times you, you hurt people and you screwed up your life. It hurts like hell. So what, what Gehenna seems to be is a process of honest self-encounter, of seeing our human limitation and dealing with the regrets and the disappointments of life. And so the, it's interesting um, what, what, you know, the maximum length of time, am I on screen share? I can't tell if I am. No? Yes? No, I didn't. No, okay. No. The maximum length of time for for the rabbis if, if, if in in Gehenna is is twelve months, and how long do we say Kaddish? Well, eleven months. Le days, why only eleven, 11 months? Because none of our relatives need all twelve months, <laughs> right? And as I I think I said this last time, um, you know, as a psychotherapist, people come to me and say, my father should get twenty four, thirty six months, right? But but like in Shiva, and somebody mentioned this earlier, 
what we have here is a sense of an interconnection between the world of the living and the world of the dead. So while the, while, hang on, my, my uh, clicker is not working, but let's see. Okay, it doesn't matter. So, you know, the soul is in a process of, of its own cleansing, just as we, the bereaved, are going through our own process of transformation in terms of our relationship. And the, the understanding in Jewish tradition is our saying Kaddish redeems the soul from Gehenna, to which I say, well, what the hell does that mean? Anyone want to comment? Because I think that's problematic. I think that's very problematic to talk about, about the soul, um, you know, our, our saying Kaddish redeems the soul from Gehenna. So my question is about people who are evil. So if you have a mass murderer or someone, do they have the same, do they travel to Gehenna and, and end up going past Gehenna after the 11 months? Or so I, I, I have to say, I don't remember what it was like since the last time. You know, I can only speculate with you. Uh, obviously, if there's a purification process, somebody who's dirtier, they need they need they need a, you know a, a deeper transformative process. At least, if we take it in terms of the rabbinic understanding, Gehenna is a finite period of time. Later, we'll see with 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 Gilgal with reincarnation. The question is, do they go in, do they go into reincarnation? Do, do, do they go into in, in, into Gehenna? I don't know. You know, I, I, I really have to say, ultimately, this is a working hypothesis for pastoral care rather than a fixed theology, a fixed philosophy of, 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 of the soul. So I have to ultimately say, uh, you know, I've, I've, I've studied my text, I've worked with people, I've written on this, but ultimately there are no final answers to the mystery of life and death. Bob, excuse and then, me. And I, yeah, go. Um, I, 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 when I, was saying Kaddish for my mother, I was told that it does help the soul and that every year they can go higher in the next world. So I have, I remember having breakfast one morning and someone saying, you don't really believe all that stuff, do you? And I said, yeah, I do. Of course, I don't understand it. So I always thought that um, even in, in after, after um, the, the 12 months or whatever, that there, that, is, is this part of the belief that that purifica purification continues ad infinitum yes, in the and next I'm world? Yes, Lori, Lori but, but that one, more, one more thing I want to add. I, it's all this has always been a struggle for me. Um, so, what happens to people who have no one to say kaddish for them? Well, I think that's when I when there, ever there's kaddish, I always pray for those who have no one to say kaddish for them. I always add that. Well, I think it's problematic to say that, uh, on one hand, it, 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 it is in the tradition to say that St. Kaddish redeems the soul from Gehenna. On the other hand, not everybody has somebody to say Kaddish, and not everybody says, says Kaddish. Right. You right. know, I, I, I had a client who was like, oh my God, what's going to happen to my father? You know, she wasn't Jewish. What's going to happen to my father? My father's stuck. You know, and I said, you know what? Don't worry. There are people on the other side to help your father. I think you have to do your own work in bereavement. One oh, more I question. Love that. And I want, I want to, I want to say you. something about the Kaddish. Uh, Sheva. Yeah, I just want to say that um, the way that you phrased the question originally, it just made me think of the Mormons who convert dead people to Mormonism because they're worried that their bodies are going to go to soul and I, to hell. And I know it's a different religion and a different concept, but the way you phrased the question, that made me just wonder about like, huh, so is saying Kaddish for those 11 months a similar kind of... Um, Okay, so let me do my, uh, this is, this is my Gehenna Kaddish wrap, and I'm going to see if I can do it standing up without cutting off my head. Hang on, I'm just going to walk away and close this light for a second. I'm coming back, I promise. I promise you I'm coming back. Okay, so <laughs> let's see how we're going to do this. This is, here's my piece of, this is my Sidur, okay? Here, here, we'll take this Sidur over here, right? So I'm the, I'm the guy who shows up saying Kaddish the first day. You, you SOB, 
You didn't leave a life insurance policy. You liked your work more than your kids. And now I have to say these stupid words that don't say anything about death. And then I imagine the soul on the other side says, and you, you were a pain in the to raise. You were always so busy with your friends. You never had time for your family. You were not an easy kid to raise, right? And then it, it, it's three months, you know, yitkadal, yitkadash. You know what, daddy? I didn't know, I'm doing this as a son to a father, but you can do it in any way you want. Daddy, I, I didn't know you. I had no idea who you were. And the, and, and the response comes back on the other side and says, I didn't know me. What did I know? I was 21 when I got married. I was 22 when I had my kids. They taught me how to make a living. I didn't teach me about, I, you know, knowing myself since I've died. I've had a few months here. So, you know, I realized that. <laughs> Six months, seven months, you know, and it's not a timeline, but it's a process people go through. You know what, that today, I remember, I never heard you say I love you. I never heard that in a family. And he, and he comes to me and the soul responds says, you know what? I never heard it growing up. Of course I love you. And I, and I have a lot of regret. I have a lot of regret that, 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 I didn't, that I didn't express that love for you. It's eight months, it's nine months. You know what, for some reason today, today I just really, really miss you. Today I just really, really, really miss you. And the response comes back and says, you know what? I really missed you. I made a lot of mistakes. So I hope you'll find a way to forgive me. I'm really sorry. I'm really, really sorry that I missed you in the ways I did. And it's the last day of St. Kaddish. And I think we need a better ritual. You know, you know what, Daddy? I've been upset. I've been angry. But you know what? Today, I want to say, when I say my last Kaddish, I want to say, I love you and I forgive you. And the response comes back on the other side and says, look, take what I gave you and make the best of it. Forgive me for what I couldn't be there, but I bless you on your journey. And is that redeeming souls from Gehenna? You know, it, it touches people's heart. Keep, 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 keep yourself muted. So, you know, right? I think that, I think that that's, you know, sometimes I do this, there's not a dry eye in the house because it really captures the psycho-emotional piece of the dynamic in our relationship with a parent. But I think what's really the takeaway on this is that the connection between the world of the living and the world of the dead continues after death. And that's what Jewish afterlife teachings help us to understand. Comments? Anyone? Yeah, Bob? Uh, a question, and maybe it's semi-obvious, but not quite. Um, there's the 30 days and there's the 11 months. Um, and you only say the 11 months of it for a parent. For parents. That's what I've learned. Uh, yeah. And then 30 days are for everybody else, you might. Which yeah, could include, so in modernity, people, in the liberal communities, people are making it a year. All right, which could include a child, you know, 30 days. You, know, you, you, you need but, more than 30 days for a child, that's for sure. But, yeah, but I'm just saying, you know, so is there some discussion about why there's that difference, or is it just a, one of those... Custom well, thing. you know, it's it's interesting if you read this stuff. I try to read this stuff with a, with a dual with a dual lens. You know, one is to read it in its historical context. You know, like when a woman is sitting shiva, she's allowed to do the laundry. You know, a, a man who a man whose wife died, he's allowed to get married right after the thirty days because he needs somebody to raise the kids. You know, so in that context, it didn't have the same kind of psychological complexity that I think we have today. So, you know, some of this, some of our Jewish death practices are state of the art, but they're state of the art, the 1640 Poland. Um, and so, you know, like, like, the, like not saying, not having a funeral when a child dies um, before 30 days. You know, somebody goes through three years of in vitro fertilization and then has a, has a, has a stillbirth and you say no funeral and you say, well, what do you mean? You know, what, what are you talking about? So for, for your great, great grandmother and mine, if there were seven out of 11 children who, who lived, you were doing them a favor by not having to have a whole process of funeral, you know, burial and Shiva for the stillbirth today. It's a very different situation. So all of these rituals are in, are in transition. Okay. We're, I promised I wasn't going to leave you in Gehenna, and we're going to we're going to we're going to we're going to go go into uh, 
the next realm now. Um, the rabbis, interestingly enough, said three times the amount on Gehenna as they did on Gan Eden because they were ethicists. They weren't predominantly metaphysicians. They were saying, you know, there's Gehenna do mitzvahs. Okay, so here's the chart, right? So we've just done this, this, this emotional purification, emotional purgation, and uh, Rabbi Melech, Eli Melech's friend here is in between Gehenna and Gan Eden. It's actually in, in some of the texts they talk about a lower Gan Eden. Lower Gan Eden, you see this life. And what, what was this life all about? In Upper Gan Eden, you begin to see this life from the standpoint of multiple incarnations. You know, here I see, oh, you know, I did this, I did that, I did this. And, and then at another level of, of cosmic knowing, I see, ah, oh, that's based on my incarnational history. That's why I had to marry that person, or that's why I went through these these traumas. Yep. Yeah. Oh, no. I, I saw my picture with my hand up. I wanted to answer my question. <laughs> okay. Uh, my reader of choice, Bob, go. Okay. So, okay. so now we've entered into the heavenly garden of Eden. Gan Eden. Gan Eden has two gates of carbuncle and 60 myriads of ministering angels keep watch. Each of these angels shine like the radiance of the heavens. When the righteous person approaches, angels remove from them the clothes in which they had been buried and clothe them with eight robes of, cloud, of the clouds of glory and place upon their head two crowns, one of precious stones and pearls and the other of gold. And they place eight myrtles in his hand and praise them. And they lead them to a place full of waters surrounded by 800 spices, species of roses and myrtles. Look. I'm not even sure what to make of this stuff, okay? <laughs> but it, it's, it, I, think, I think the, the um, useful metaphor here is the righteous person approaches and angels remove from them the clothes in which they had been buried and clothe them with eight robes of clowns of glory. It's like at a certain point we, we are, are um, alleviated of our terrestrial selves and we become our more celestial selves. Like... In this incarnation, I am Simcha of these parents in this time in history with this emotional style. But at another level, the soul, the consciousness that has an eternal nature is a whole other way of knowing and being. And, and in moments of meditation and spiritual vision, we connect with that place. And so this here is at least how the, the you know, this is the Masachet Gan Eden is also like sort of Jewish Dante material. And, and who was the one, one who talked about, um, who talked, uh, talked about, about your site? You want, you want to read it? Where are you? Where, where what are we? Wait, reciting? I'm going to, hang on. No, who, who was it? It was, uh, um, I don't have your name here in front of me. Okay, Bob, you read. You're, you, you read. Okay, reciting Kad. Oh, no. Which one? I, which one? Wherever I was, I, I, I have to go backwards in time. Okay. So this is a correlation between Gan Eden and, and Yortzite. Reciting Kaddish at the time of a Yortzite elevates the soul every year to a higher sphere in Gan Eden. That was Luria. So it's Luria said it. So the notion of Gan Eden is that there are seven realms of Gan Eden. And so the, the extent to which we have evolved spiritually is the extent to which we are allocated a realm in Gan Eden. And uh, it's said that there are soul groupings. You know, the rabbinic notion of Gan Eden is that that, that that the men sat around and studied Torah all day and the women served them. There's another text about the seven realms of women in Gan Eden, right? So it's a higher evolutionary state and, and it connects with your site because the, the, the Hasidim would say, the neshama is al-haban and aliyah, the soul should ascend higher and higher. And I, I think in moments of the your site, the, the window of connection between this realm and, 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 and the realm beyond opens up. And, you know, people have, have these stories, uh, you know, that, that I remember when I was a kid growing up, um, my father, when I would go out on a date, my father would take a dollar bill and he would sort of, you know, he'd like fold it in four and he'd give it to me. 
you know, give me a, whatever, give me a $5 bill, you know, give me a $10, $5 bill, right? So one time I was speaking about this. No, no. And one time it was my father's York site and I got out of my van and to go to Starbucks and right on the ground was a $10 bill folded up in four. I felt like I got a raise. And so I was speaking about this at a congregation in Ohio. And the next morning, somebody came in and said, your father was here because I found the $10 bill folded up in the parking lot. So I don't know how this stuff happens, but I think what I say to people is be aware of meaningful coincidences, coincidences around the time of somebody's birthday or somebody's York site, because there's a certain way in which there's a transparency between the worlds. There's a certain way in which there's a transparency within the world. Okay, I said I wasn't going to leave you in Gan Eden. I'm not sure how much of the Gehenna, the Gilgal stuff we're going to do, but but let's let's go back here. Okay, so um, is there anything more I want to say about this? Like I said, there were, if if you look at a book called Legends of the Jews, there's three times as much information in Gehenna as there is on, on Gan Eden. You know, they they really want to make sure you do mitzvahs. You want to you want to avoid Gehenna. Do mitzvahs. Okay. In some places, Gan Eden is the end of the journey. I, I lost it. I'll, let's see if I can go back. No, no. Yes. In some cases, Gan Eden is the end of the journey. Okay. The rabbis didn't have to standardize belief. They had to standardize practice. They had to make sure everybody lit Shabbos candles relative to the setting of the sun or everybody read the Megillah, Megillah Esther relative to the cycle of the moon. Of, 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 of the moon. But if this one believed Gehenna looked like that, and the other one believed Gehenna looked like this, it didn't matter. There was a lot of room for midrashic improvisation. So in some cases, Gun Aden is the end of the journey. The soul enters into Gun Aden, end of story. In other cases, there's another realm called Tzror Hakayim, the source of life. Sometimes it's called the bundle of life. You know those five letters on the Hebrew tombstone? Anybody? what they are? Anybody know what they are? Elisheva, you're, you're nodding. What are they? What do they say? Well, there are different sets, but one is um, about this soul gets um, It's a hey nishmato tzrorah tzror hachayim. May your soul be bound up in the bond, in the bond of life. Or, or te hey nishmata, nishmata, nishmata nishmato. And we do it very platitudinously. May her soul be bound up in the bond of life. Continue services on page 472. <laughs> and for the Kabbalists, Tzror HaChaim was a very specific realm. It was said to be a realm under the throne of God where souls would return to. So you get this text here. I'll read it. That holy celestial abode called the bundle of the living, where that holy superior grade called super soul regales itself with supernal delights. I have no idea what that really means, but it's a kind of, you know, the best, the best metaphor I can use I have to say this is, you know, a soul comes into incarnation just as, as an egg comes in for insemination down the fallopian tube. So maybe it goes all the way back up to the source of life. You know, I, I don't know about that because I I, I, I'm not sure from both, both philosophically and, and biologically if I, if I know what I'm talking about at all. But Tzror HaChaim is this place where souls go back to. And, and in some cases, it has to do with reincarnation. But also, it corresponds with the Yisker. Now, the Shiva in seven days and Gehenna, Gan Eden, Gehenna, Gehenna and 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 um, and and Kaddish and um, Gan Eden and and Yisker, Gehenna and, and Kaddish, Gan Eden, Yisker. That's in the tradition. This is my own making up of this because there's stories of a woman who's coming to say Yisker for her mother, saying, "Ma, can you help me have a child?" And then the next year she shows up with a child who looks like the deceased mother. So. I want to suggest, I did this talk this week uh, for Kaboy for, Venichum, um, that Yisker is a kind of soul-guiding ritual. And so there's some connection between souls in the highest realms and Yisker. Um, so then you, know, you get, then you get this whole notion of intercessory prayer. What's Fiddler on the Roof if it's not an intercessory story? Right? 
the, uh, from a Sarah comes through from the other side and lends her opinion. And then the Tzadikim, this, this is Isaac Luria's grave. And, and this is also, here is uh, Kever Rachel, and this is Rabbi Nachman's grave. So there's a whole tradition, particularly among the Svaradim, of going to the grave of the Rebbe and praying for intercession. So there's this whole notion in the early phases, we are helping the soul in the journey, but then the later phases, the soul is, is available to offer us guidance. So the ancestors are available for guidance. So at the last part of the Tahara, there's a, an intercessory prayer to ask the, the deceased that it to help with any blessing that the people who are in the Haber Kadisha uh, might offer. Right. And were you on my talk on Monday? No. Did I see you there? I wanted so, to be. There's a whole extensive tradition around intercession. You know, going back to the time of the Maccabees, um, in 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 one of the books of the Maccabees, Judah and his um, Judah and his brothers um, are, are 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 offering sacrifices, which they interpret as 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 uh, sending money to the temple to to save the souls of these people who they found dead on the battlefield. Um, and then you have this whole thing, tzedaka, tzed, you give tzedaka in, in honor of somebody who has died as a way of sort of redeeming their soul. So we have that whole, that whole tradition in there. Yeah. Sandra, were you, were you waving or just, or you have no, I, I, I was going to say the Chabadniks go to the rabbi's oil with uh, prayers and papers for questions that they want answered. And they believe they get the answers directly from the Rebbe, who died, what, 25 years ago? So and that Rebbe, the late Lubavitcher Rebbe, yeah. every, he rarely left Brooklyn. Yeah. And every Friday afternoon, he would take a bag of kvitlach that he would get. He would get, and they'd give, they'd give him all these little kvitlach, all these little, little petitionary prayers. And he would bring them to the ohel of his late father-in-law, uh, who was at Reb Zalman's Rebbe. As I like to say to the Chabadniks, your Rebbe and my Rebbe had the same Rebbe. So uh, what this is, I, 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 I'm going to do a couple of Gilgul texts, but I want to sort of summarize what we've done here with the following. Between the life between birth and death is uh, whoops sorry what life between birth and death is only one half of the cycle of existence the other half is between death and rebirth this is this is jewish views of the afterlife in a thumbnail sketch so in life there's youth, maturity, and old age, though we know that some people die before they reach old age, and some people reach old age and they bypass maturity. And then in death, there are these deathbed visions that we talked about, the life review, the familial beings, the mythic guide, the being of light, and we we'll talk about the elements next week. So it's a process separating from the body. Then there's emotional purgation, cleaning up the the karma under the rug, if you will. Then there's heavenly bliss, Gan Eden. And then there's returning to the source of life. And then, as you, you alluded to, Elisheva, there are all these in-womb texts of, of preparing for rebirth. You know, so, so this is a whole other way of thinking about life and death. If we lived our encounters with dying and death through this model, it would be very, very different because we fear death as a as as an end. Some people do more than others, and yet this is a this is a whole other way of thinking about dying and death. Anybody want to comment on that? I think that's one of my favorite slides in all this. So, so the story is that. that wait, wait, wait! I want to give every, Marla has not a chance. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. On. No, no, let her go because I have a different question. Well, go with so your question. The, she said she's got a, she's got some airtime already. Today. Never mind. Go on. Go on. Go on, Marla. My question um, was about the Kaddish and whether, um, in your opinion, having studied all of this, is the Kaddish 
more for the soul of the one who departed or is it more for us? Yes. <laughs> it's both. It's both. Okay. Well, Chaya, did you want to come to the chart? I just wanted to say about the preview, that's what the, the indentation between the nose and the, the lips are, is that we learn before we are allowed, we, we go incarnate, we're taught Torah, and then we're touched by the angel before we, we our souls enter the, this existence. And there's a text that said, they show you Gan Eden, they show you Gehenna, and they say, you see those people there? You see those people? There? Do mitzvahs. Okay, anyone else want to comment on that uh, another chart? I got five more minutes. I want. I want to. Okay, so the Gehenna stuff is is in in my um, second edition, my third edition of Jewish Views of the Afterlife. I quadrupled the amount of material I had on 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 Gilgal and reincarnation, and I could do a whole lecture on that. And we're not doing that one now. But I. But and you have some texts there. But I want to show you, in some sense, what the the um, overarching theology is with regard to the reincarnation in, in, in Kabbalah. So um, there's this one here, which is actually in the, um, this is in the art scroll Sidur. This is not in, a, in, a, in a, an esoteric or cryptic text. Master, this is part of the um, Kriyat Shmal Hamita, the, the prayer said at nighttime. Master of the universe, I hereby forgive anyone who angered or antagonized me or sinned against me, against my body, my property, my honor, against anything of mine, whether he did so accidentally, willfully, carelessly, or purposely, whether through speech, deed, thought, or notion, whether in this transmigration or another transmigration. That's mainstream Borough Park, afterlife and reincarnation. And they didn't teach you that in Hebrew school. And then this, okay, I'm going back to my, my, my reader. Bob, you want to read okay. this? Rabbi Shimon said to them, friends, the time has come to reveal some mysteries concerning the transmigration of souls. This applies when the soul is required to reincarnate either because of sins or because it had not completely fulfilled the obligations in Torah and mitzvot while alive in this world. It is forced to come back to this world and don a body that is to be born again and finish what was imposed on it for the 70 years of the life in this world. From so what, what's, why do you reincarnate? So you can do the mitzvot you're supposed to do. Right? I mean, this, again, there's a couple of different reasons, but one of them is yeah. you, you, you reincarnate to keep fulfilling mitzvot. And if you haven't done the mitzvot, if there's a particular mitzvah you haven't done, you haven't done it. And then they do some interesting things, like what happens if a, mar if a man is married to a woman and he hasn't done all the mitzvot and she has, well, she can, she can reincarnate anyways to stay with him. You know, I mean, yeah, this, this stuff is pretty cryptic in some ways. Okay, well, yeah. this is another one. Bob, you're my, you're my reader here. It's essential that the sins of a righteous person be cleared so that he will be able to enter Gan Eden. Thus, there is no rectification for him except reincarnation. For every sin which he does not atone through suffering during his lifetime, for which he cannot go to Gehenna to receive his punishment for them, he will require another reincarnation to rectify it. Okay, so this, so the, there was ending up being a, almost like a, a competition, or, or you know, like, 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 you know, definitely competition. What, which, does a person reincarnate or do they go to Gehenna? So there were some sins that was said that you, that that you couldn't, you couldn't even atone for them in Gehenna. This stuff is complex. I want, I'm giving you like a a, a a three minute snapshot, and then there's one last one here. This is this is about the this is the Jewish bodhisattva. There is the soul that is called the universal soul, from Rabbi Shneur Zalman of Liadi. This soul is connected to all souls and reincarnates solely for the purpose of helping other souls achieve their proper elevation. A universal soul has responsibility for all souls being that it is connected with all souls. When this universal soul reincarnates to help other people reach their elevations, it is guaranteed that this elevated soul will not sin and will be inclined to do only good. 
So in the text, there's some, you reincarnate to do mitzvahs, you reincarnate to atone sins, or the universal soul reincarnates for, um, for the purpose of, of working with other souls. So um, that was a Holocaust, old soul, I'm not doing that one, this is this. So here, wait, where's my, I, I had, I lost my last slide. Let me see if I have it. So I, I let me unshare my screen, stop the share and end by saying, the bottom line in all of this is between this world and the world beyond is a window and not a wall. Between this world and the world beyond is a window and not a wall. And so once we filter Jewish teachings on afterlife into our thinking about life and death and, 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 and bereavement and grief and all of that, we begin to recognize that there is a sense of, inter of interconnection between worlds. And in moments of dreams or prayers or our silent contemplation or synchronistic moments, we feel that window opening. So uh, I want to bless you that you feel the window open and that you know that your loved ones are watching over you. So that's what I want to say for today. Amen, amen, amen. Um, it would be great to have that um, last graphic. It was not in the packet download. Well, it's, it's one of the last words of my book, and I'll give it to you. Between this world and the world beyond is a window and not a wall. That, that's, that's not from a sacred text. It's from my book. I'll tell, you, I'll tell you that story. I was teaching in a boardroom. I was teaching in a boardroom in a synagogue, and there was a glass wall out to the hall. So like the boardroom was completely open, but they had curtains there. And I was talking, I was answering a question, and it was closed. And so I said to the person, between this world and the world beyond is a window. And I opened up the blinds and not a wall. And ever since that, that's been the moniker on my, on my teaching of this material. Okay, um, I'm okay to hear a couple more questions. We're, we're at the end of time. So if you need to go, I thank you. And we'll be back same time, same station. Um, I have to remember when I stop the recording to to wait for it to completely download. Anyone else, any other comments, questions? Okay, watch your dreams and, um, and I, I, I thank you all for your presence here today. Shalom, shalom, shalom. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.